uh, we're doing in a study here of Moses. And we're following exactly what the Bible says. These are dark sayings. These are hidden meanings. We're not looking for the existence of any man. We're not looking for the existence of... We're looking for a meaning and a purpose. The story of the Exodus, Moses, the Exodus, is this. The lower part of your mind that causes you fear and guilt and all of those things that hold you in bondage is mystically and symbolically referred to as Egypt. That's the lower mind, called in the Bible the carnal mind. The ego, which is part of you, which screams at you and keeps you in line, is the Pharaoh. Okay, that's the ego. Moses is that part which comes out of the truth within you and represents that which will lead you out of the bondage of the lower mind over to the right hemisphere of the brain where you then will be in the, the promised land of God's chosen people. Now, there, that's what this is. You know, what I'm saying to you is that the exodus of 400,000 people coming out of it did not happen. The Red Sea did not actually open. I, I was telling a fellow in, um, in work the other day, and I was telling him about Adam and Eve and that Adam represents the atom, A-T-O-M, and that um, we are given that as proof because in order to multiply the species, God removes a rib from Adam to make Eve. Well, basically, when you multiply energy, you remove an electron from an atom and you multiply the energy. So that what the book tells you here is that all life came from the splitting of the atom. Say. Now this fellow looked at me and he says, well, okay, but I mean, couldn't an all-loving and all-knowing God actually take a rib out of a man and make a woman? I said, the problem with that is that this all-loving and all-creating God gave you a brain and also gave you common sense and doesn't expect you to drop it and eliminate it because you pick up a Bible. I mean, you have to begin to understand science, you have to begin to understand nature, you have to begin to understand the laws of the universe. The ancient people, I'm going to give you two symbols or two symbolic exercises that are important. One is, is the progression of the five stages of consciousness, which is earth, that's the first stage, that's your lower stage, that's where the fear is. Water, when you enter into meditation, you rise into that second stage, which is water, which is truth. Air, which is the third stage, which is no thought. That's above thought. Fire, which is the fourth stage, which is spirit. And the new mind is the fifth stage. Okay? This is also baptism. You take your, the earth, which is your mind, you bring it into meditation, into the water, and you rise up into the third stage, which is air, where there is no thought. Okay? Um, how, how, you know, ridiculous we are because we had taken this very occult and mystical thing and instead of understanding it as consciousness, we go to a lake and dip our head in the water and then come up into the air and say we've made it and, we, you know, lost the whole thing. But that's one thing we want to keep in mind today. The second thing is a strange thing that the ancients wrote about and it's called Kundalini. Kundalini. And what it is, is an energy which rises up the spine, okay, like that. It is referred to as a female energy, and it's referred to as the sleeping serpent. The sleeping serpent. And when you go into meditation, the energy awakens, and the serpent, which is a female energy, then rises up the spine. It impacts the pineal gland of the brain, and opens the right hemisphere of the brain. Um, you can see this when you go to the doctor's office. He has a little pin generally on his lapel, which is called a caduceus, and you'll see this rod, and then you'll see these two serpents rising up, intertwining. That's kundalini, which doctors walk around, and I'm sure if you said to your doctor, that's kundalini, he'll say, oh, yeah, no, it isn't. I, you know, I prefer uh, rigatoni or something like that. You wouldn't know what the heck you're talking about. Anyhow, this is what basically two things that I think I wanted to show you because they directly impact on what we're going to be talking about. Okay, remember we had, the question now is, you're in fear, you're in guilt, you're in all kinds of stresses of the mind and all kinds of difficulties of the mind, 
and you've made up your mind you're going to try to move out of that condition. You then enter into the water, which is meditation. Moses means drawn out. Out of the water, out of that second stage of meditation, comes this child from within you, which will be the child that will lead you out of the guilt and fear of Egypt of the lower mind into that which is the right hemisphere of the brain. The emotions, which are the churning Red Sea, will split apart, and you go over into the Promised Land. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, as Moses is born, as that child is born within you, it starts to come into conflicts with the other aspects of your mind. That's when Moses kills somebody and then he has to run out. When you run away, you run out into the wilderness. Moses goes into the wilderness. That's when you're now driving into that point of meditation. When you go into the wilderness, you go into meditation. If you'll look with me at page 1005 in the book of Revelation, and uh, I believe it's 1005, uh, Revelation chapter 5, there is a description of this electrical energy. Let, look, look at me for just a second, okay? Let me tell you something here. There is no earth in your head, there is no water in your head, there is no air in your head, there is no fire in your head. There is no sleeping serpent in your body, okay? These are all symbols of what? Electrical energy. That's all it is. It's symbols of electrical energy, and it's simply describing how the electrical energy works within your body. That this is very, uh, it's a very scientific principle, and all of these words are used to represent. And the wilderness is just the operation of electrical energy and meditation. Moses is an aspect of electrical energy that will come to life with you when you start to obey these different scientific principles. All right? Look what it says in Revelation chapter 5, and this is a description of Kundalini. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, that that right hand is the right hemisphere of the brain, and the throne is the higher mind, a book, this is what you call the book of life, written within, that's within you, and on the back side, that's the spine, sealed with seven seals. Those are the seven chakras of the seven nerve aspects of Kundalini. So there's a description. And you know, when I was a kid, whenever I went to school, with Catholic school, they always say, is your name written in the book of life? And, and you know, of course, that's, that's we all have been growing. Well, what is the book of life? We just saw it in the Bible. It's Kundalini. It is the energy within you that rises up the back, up the spine, sealed with seven seals. Well, as we get into the story of, of, uh, of Exodus, uh, go to page 49, Exodus chapter 4. We found that Moses went into the wilderness, okay? And when Moses went into the wilderness, he went to the back side of the desert. And that's, that's an interesting thing. Look at chapter 3 of Exodus. And you'll see in verse 1, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, blah, blah. He led the flock to the back side of the desert. All right? What are you seeing here? Here's where you go into meditation, which is the wilderness. You go to the back side. That means you're starting to activate this electrical energy that flows up the spine. And when you do, you go up into the mountain, which is the higher consciousness where you confront the burning bush. Okay, you know, maybe the guy couldn't, you know, deal with it. Maybe he wants to believe that... Uh, somebody ripped the rib out of this guy and made a lady out of it. Which is, you know, that's just silly and making God to look silly and us who make him really look stupid. But now you got a guy sitting up there talking through a bush. I do that, but I mean, the average person doesn't really, you know, I like to talk to trees and things like that. You know, interesting thing. In all the years I've been in business uh, and working, I, you know, I started to relocate. I'm going to be working out of the house and then working out of corporate in Philadelphia. But in all my offices, when I've been in a cable business for 22, 23 years, I've had this plastic duck with me. And it sat in every office and experienced all the lunacy that I've went through, all the business conferences, everything. And, you know, it was time to take the duck. He's been with me in Brick, been with me in Point Pleasant, been with me in Trenton. He's not going to Philadelphia. I brought him back home. Um, I said, come on, it's time to go. Well, I put him in the car, and he was laying on its side. And I, and I, and I looked back there, and I, I got him up, and I put him on the seat next to me. <laughs> Why? It's, it's just plastic, but it's a symbol of something very, very important to me. Every memory, every confrontation I had with unions, every exciting thing I had with HBO and launching, and all these different things, it represented something very special. So that inanimate object, which was all of a sudden just there, a piece of plastic, suddenly became something real, because as soon as I look at it, 
it brings back tons of memories of people that I worked with and experiences that it hurts. So it becomes a symbol. So it's very, very important. So this burning bush then is when you go to the backside or you start to activate the Kundalini at your spine, it raises you up to the higher consciousness, which is the mountain, and there you confront the fire. That's the full stage of consciousness. The burning bush. The bush is implanted. It's the stem in the center of the brain. And so then you start being talked to by fire or that which is spirit. So you see this is all an, a, a, an aspect of electrical energy and that's where we left the story last week where this Moses is talking to this bush now. When you get to this point where you come to meditation and this starts happening within you, you then run into a very consistent problem. I have it all the time, and those of you who have started to come here and started to talk about things scientifically and things that make sense have a very difficult problem with people on the, quote, outside who are part of religion or a part of the systems. It's very difficult for people to deal with these types of things. Here we go in Exodus chapter 4 on page 49. And what does Moses say to this burning bush? Now here's a guy talking to a bush that's on fire and you know God's telling him to do this thing but this is you now you've gotten to this point and Moses said but look they're not gonna believe me they're not gonna listen to me they're not they're gonna say yeah who can you tell who can you tell of your experiences I have people come in here and, and some of the whacked out things you see and some of the whacked out things I see or I experience we're the only ones we can tell because we won't laugh at each other no matter how bizarre it is. But yet, if you tell these people outside about this thing, they say, oh, you must go to that church down in the cellar. You better stay out of there. You know, you, you only hear all this kind of weird stuff. Who can you tell? So Moses' concern is a true concern. Who's going to believe you? Nobody. Who can I tell this to? You know, here I'm telling a guy that this is what the Bible is talking about. The splitting of the atom is the origin of all life. That makes perfect sense. I can get every scientist in the world to say that's right. But you won't get one person who's a religious person to agree with it. No, God ripped the rib out. He made, he ripped a rib, he couldn't figure any other way. He ripped a rib, rib out and made a lady. That makes sense. When that makes sense to you, then you realize how far away you are from quote unquote God. That you are dwelling on something that is written in deep symbolism the book says don't take it literally but you insist on taking it literally and so then you cannot come to a point of understanding science nature or God you can't because you're so overwhelmed by fairy tales okay so then Moses says who the heck is gonna believe me who's gonna believe you go out you go wait for those people to come out of church or this afternoon or whenever they come out of church and tell them this stuff and see if they'll believe you you know it's sensible. You know this is true. You know you can prove this. You can prove this with science. You can prove this with doctors. You can prove this with, with, with the encyclopedia. You can prove this. But who can, you can't tell these people because they won't believe that you've had this experience. They won't believe that you've had these visions. They won't believe that you've had. But let's go now beyond that into a more occult science. And watch this very, very carefully. And for the first time in your life, I think you'll understand this if you've ever read it before. Give me your attention now, real close, and I'll show you something about this. You want proof to yourself first, okay? The Lord says, verse 2, watch it, I want you to read it, look at it very carefully. And the Lord said, what is it in your hand? And Moses said, a rod. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. The rod is your spine. It represents the physical aspect of your nature, the flesh, the ego. What's being said there? When you will put it down, when you will relinquish control of the lower self, it will become Kundalini. It will become a serpent. And it will prove to you that I am. If you went years ago, you saw the movie Moses or whatever it was, the Red Sea, and they showed him throwing a rod on the ground and it became a snake. Huh? That's what we have always believed. This is extremely occult. 
The rod stands for that which is your foundation. It stands for that which is your authority. And the foundation of your physical being, the foundation of your, your, your being totally is that rod, that which is the spine. And what is being said there is when you relinquish control of it, when you will throw it down, it will then become kundalini. When you sit in meditation and are no longer dependent on your own flesh, on your own ego, on your own self, then she will awake. The sleeping serpent will awake and that rod that has been the support and the foundation of your physical being will suddenly be the serpent which will arise and wake up and be the total foundation of your spiritual being. Now, look at Exodus 4.4. 4. Okay. And the Lord said, put your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it and it became a rod in his hand. The energy of the kundalini sleeping serpent starts from the point of the coccyx, which is the tailbone. And what's being said, you throw it down, it'll become spirit, take it in your hand, take control of it again, it'll become that which is your physical flesh. You're not going to lose control of yourself because it becomes the serpent. You can take back that authority to yourself whenever you wish. Throw it down. Spirit, I am not dependent on myself. Take it back. It's you. Throw it down. It's God. Take it back. It's you. You can have it whenever you want it. You can let it go whenever you choose. I just got a, uh, <coughs> do you feel it? That's it. She's awoken. She's come to life. But there is such a beautiful statement that has been made so long ago and such a mystique of that which she is. She is there to come and rise up and consume all of that hate and fear and guilt. But whenever you say, you are taking control again, you shall take control. Just like that. You always are in charge. Always. The only time you're not in charge and God is in charge is when you are willing to relinquish that charge and let the serpent rise. But when the serpent is rising and you say, I want it back, grab it. It's back. There's a beautiful saying that the Hindu takes the flute to his lips and the prana, prana breath gives forth a harmony and then the serpent starts to rise out of that little basket. And, 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 and the harmony and rhythm is it says, when the flute is on the lips of God, the serpent will rise. And the serpent is always a, a picture of that which is God and it's always a picture of that which is the rebirth because it sloughs its skin, it'll slide right out of its skin and it begins the life all over again with new skin and it, 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 it gets rid of the old covering, takes that new covering. See? So, so there it is. When you, if you go to the movie or something like that and if you want to dwell in fairy tales and if you want to dwell in superstitions, then he threw down the stick and it became a snake. On the other hand, if you really want to understand, you're being introduced to one of the most occult and one of the deepest aspects of what it is dwelling within you, and a story written thousands upon thousands of years ago as to what the power really is, then you will understand that if you're willing to drop that dependence on yourself, your mind, your ego, your flesh, if you're willing to throw down the rod, which is the basis of your life, which is that which is dependent on the, then it will turn into the serpent and she will uncurl from that three and a half rep and rise up the spine like the caduceus. And you know what the, you know what Buddha would say? Buddha says that when you go through those seven chakras, when you get and you're fighting and trying to hurt and overcome all the hurt and guilt, there is a place called the place of the eighth. And there when you will lift that covering, she will arise and the serpent will come and she will devour all the hurts, all the fears, all the guilt, all the things that have oppressed you through your life, that oppress your children, that oppress all the people that you have had experiences with. The electrical energy 
It is a positive flow, it is a negative flow, and it's caduceus, and it flows through the spinal canal. And there's a description of it. And remember, where was this information given? When he came to the backside, went up to the mountain, and confronted the burning bush. When he then rose over the second stage of consciousness, lifted himself up into the air. Remember who he married, Zaburo, which is the bird. Lifted himself up in the air, and then went up to the mountain. He went up to the fire mountain. When you rise up above the thoughts of the mind, you're at the fire mountain, because there in the higher consciousness, you are touched by that which is the spirit. Hey, I'll tell you, what you've heard, very few people have heard. What you have heard in this room right now, very, very few people know. I dare say you could go into every church in the state of New Jersey and there was not one person who would be able to tell you that. And I hope that you would treat this very holy, very special, and understand it and meditate about it because it is life, it is nature, it is the essence of everything that is God, everything that is the universe, and it is contained within you. What have you got in your hand? You've got control. Throw it down. It becomes the serpent. It becomes the feminine principle of God, which is the spirit. And that spirit will rise and help your life. And whenever you want to take control back again, take it. There's another occult happening here, which is interesting too. And that occurs on page 49 in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore to him, Put your hand into your bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Absolute white. The hand always means energy. Okay? The hand means energy. The left hand is energy that comes in. The right hand is energy that goes out. Okay? The hand means energy. What is happening here is that when you take that energy, which is your energy, your physical energy, your human energy, and place it with inside of yourself, it becomes white. It becomes free of all the stains of the thoughts. It becomes free of all the stain of guilt. It becomes free of all of the things that hurt. As soon as you are willing to enter within yourself, to take your own human physical energy and enter deep within yourself, that energy then, that part of you that is, becomes white. It becomes pure as snow. Okay? And then look what it says. In Exodus 4, 6. Okay. And he said, put your hand into your bosom again. And he put his hand in again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. This is exactly the same. This is exactly the same as taking control of that serpent. You place it in, a lot of people say, well, you've got to be careful. See, this, this is what you've got to understand. It's so very, very important for you. A lot of people say, oh, you've got to care careful with this stuff. You've got to watch this mind stuff. Oh, you can get in a lot of trouble with this. This book is telling you, this ancient document written by God is telling you, you don't have to be careful of anything because once that serpent begins to rise, you can turn it off like that. And now it's telling you again that when you enter within yourself, and you separate from everything which is the stain, everything which is the color of that which is physical life, all you have to do whenever you so desire is pull it out. Stop it. Anytime. Instantly. It doesn't take a minute to stop. You have total control over everything. There is no God who will overwhelm you with anything. There is no God that will force you to do anything. You are told what to do to end all the savagery, to end all the violence, to end all the horrors, to end all of that which is oppressive against women, all of that which is oppressive against children, all of that which is oppressive against animals, all of that which you have seen to be oppressive against the very essence of nature itself. And it's said to you, this is what you do, and you will rise above it like a bird. But as soon as you want to return, Turn back to where you are. Bang. Turn it on. Turn it off. Do whatever you want to do. You're in control. And that's the, you know what's so true? 
<laughs> no matter how deep you can get into meditation, whenever you want to stop, stop. You can float around the room whenever you want to stop, stop. The times I had a beginning of an out-of-body experience, I started and all of a sudden I stopped like that. <laughs> Didn't want it. You don't want it, you don't want it. So there is two very occult things that we've learned. Okay. <laughs> you, you, can, you, can, you can stay with this. Go ahead. And, and what each of us are is so much junk sitting in a toilet bowl ready for somebody to flush it. Or you can jump out of there. <laughs> you got no place to go. You got nothing to look forward to other than dying. But on the other hand, there is 90% of your brain which has never been touched by you. It's sitting there. It's saying, you're screwed up. Things haven't gone right. On the other side of this Red Sea, there is impulses, electrical energy, which is the power of the universe, and you can turn it on. You can turn it on. You can turn it off. And you don't get it by going to church. You don't get it by reading Bibles. You don't get it by being religious. You get it by understanding the electrical energy of the universe and the electrical energy which is within you and touching it in the proper way. <laughs> you can't make these lights go on by rubbing wires together. You can burn the building down. But when you touch those wires in the proper way and you know what you're doing, you can light up the world. Yes? Is this the same as electromagnetic energy? They're one and the same, or is there a difference? I guess there's a difference. Electromagnetic energy, and what we're talking about now, is the same as the difference between a pussycat and a lion. One is absolutely wild and controlled by nature. The other is controlled by you. Uh, I can control this electricity by turning it and so forth and so on and making it do what I want to do. Once I open myself to the electromagnetic power of the universe, it does what it wants to do until I want to turn it off. But there's a, I think there's a, big, there's a big difference. There's a similarity, but there's a big difference is that when you move into the realm of the awesome power of nature, it's a whole different thing. And it's something that I simply say, I want it and I will fly with it. I don't know what it is, but I want it. That type of electricity, I know exactly what it is, and I know how to deal with it. So there's the two aspects of it. Throw down the rod, it becomes a serpent. You don't want it to be a serpent anymore? Take it in your hand, it becomes you. Stick your hand, go deep within yourself, you become white as snow. In other words, that has nothing to do with color in any way, shape, or form. You know what? You know how people stop stupid, stupid, stupid. I had a guy say, I said, melatonin secretes, it is skin lightener. The guy said, well, then you're saying that black people cannot be part of God. I said, how can you be so stupid? <laughs> you stupid fool. I said, well, how, do you, how can you talk to people? Say, and then the same way when it says becomes white, it doesn't mean anything to do with the color. It's describing the fact that inside of you are none of the dark essences of the guilt and fear. It becomes like snow. It's only symbolic words. They're just symbolisms. Okay. Now, in Exodus 4, verse 8, what does it say? If they won't believe you, if they won't listen to you, then they will believe the voice of this latter sign. Okay? Now, here's the point. You've gone around, and you've come into your meditation, and you felt this energy rising up you. You knew that the sleeping serpent had arisen. Now, there's no snake in you. There's no serpent in you. It's electrical energy. Did you get this straight? Please, because there are people that think there's real snakes and all of this. There's no snakes. There's no. This is electrical energy. You felt the surge. Something has started within you. But you tell somebody, oh, that's ridiculous. Or you've gone and you've entered within yourself and you've gotten rid of all of those thoughts and all of that guilt and all of that fear. Ah, yeah, but I don't want to tell. So here's what it's saying. If they don't believe you, this is what you do. Exodus chapter 4, verse 9. If they won't believe, then you shall take the water of the river, pour it upon the dry land, and the water which you take out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Now what do we have? You got the serpent. Nobody's going to believe you about that. Well, let's face it. Now, I want you to go up and on Route 9 start talking to people about the serpent inside of you and the Kundalini, and you know what you're going to get with that. Now you talk about the entering within and the snow, and you know, yeah, sure. 
don't bother me. I'm, you know, I don't want to lose my faith. You know, those but now you're getting into something which is really important. You're getting into the point of water on dry ground turning into blood. Okay? That which is blood is exactly the same symbolically in the fourth stage of consciousness as that which is fire. It's the fourth stage. Now what has happened within you is you have taken your mind, the earth. You have gone into the water, which is the second stage of consciousness. You've risen up into the air, which is the third stage where there is no thought. Now, that water, which is the truth which you have learned here, is suddenly turning into blood. It is becoming a spiritual power within you. And when you begin to talk to people, they may not agree or say that they believe you, but something deep within them realizes that you're talking in a very special way of something that makes sense for the first time maybe that they've ever heard in their life because there has been a change. I have had people tell me that they've come and they've listened to me for years and in the beginning she talking about and then all of it and but recently some all of the things that I've taught you and we've shared together over a period of years now when we're getting into the deeper part the more mature part those things you sit here and you know the strange thing might be frightening to you you understand me <laughs> there are not many people who do believe me you understand me, and you understand that I have opened to you the flower which is universal truth. And it is a flower that knows nothing of violence. It is a flower that knows nothing of war. It is a flower that knows about the unfolding of nature itself and the understanding that you must relinquish unto nature for that period of time and then take back unto yourself. And this is the point. When you have taken this truth, and you have poured it on the dry ground, which is the lower mind, it will then turn into that which is blood or fire, which is spiritual truth, which is the understanding of the universal elements, which is the understanding of the very essence of life. I mean, the very essence, the very basis part of life, even an explanation of why you're alive. Most people haven't the slightest idea. And they act like it. And then they die, and their explanation of why they died is shared in the funeral parlor. Well, he was a milkman, and God needed another milkman in heaven, so he come. <laughs> That's the best we can do. <laughs> Guy's been alive seven years. We needed another. God needed a milkman. I remember when my father died. He was an interior decorator at Macy's Department Store in New York. And I, everybody was saying, God needed another decorator up. And so the first thing I said to my mother, I do not want to be an interior decorator. <laughs> the hell with that. I'm staying here, Charlie. You can go to New York. You can go to heaven and decorate all you want. I'm staying right here. <laughs> okay. So then we're looking at a point where there's going to be a demonstration from within you. Okay? That kundalini, that serpent energy, is to convince you, and you have been reassured, that nothing can happen to you that is permanent, that will change you into anything you don't want to be. You, you pull it back whenever you want to. You're in charge. You're the captain of the ship. This point here is that third point. If you do this, if you pour this water, that is that second stage of consciousness on that lower mind. Then there'll be a change within you. And that change within you will affect the people you live. It will affect the people you work with. It will affect people that come into you. And it will affect it only even if it's just the magnet of a vibration. You know what, you know what Moody said? The reason you have all of these wild storms and the, and the reason that nature is so screwed up is because of the negative vibrations of millions of people going into the universe. You say, oh, that's silly. Is it silly? Go into your house. You ever come home at night and you're in bad mood? You got bad vibes and you know the hell that you're causing the house? Did you ever walk in the house and somebody else is in a bad mood or putting off bad vibes and the other one has that she causes it or he causes it? <laughs> Instantly. And so if you've done that, if one person has done that in the house, what do millions of people do to the house which is the universe? Set it into a rage. But now, on the other hand, Shakyamuni Buddha says, if people start putting positive vibrations of nature into the universe, then what happens? What happens is the planet Earth, which has been made into a hell by the negative vibrations, comes to be the planet heaven, made into the planet heaven by the positive vibration. This must be an important one, because this is the first time my nose has gotten itchy. In the <laughs> okay. So what you have to do then is follow this if you wish. You know, how important is it? It doesn't cost you any money. 
You don't have to go to church. You don't have to read any Bibles. But you have to do something which most of us don't like to do. You have to get to know yourself. And you know what? Most of us have never been introduced to ourselves. We don't know. All we know about ourselves is what we've been told by our parents, what we've been told by our schools, what we've been told by the military, what we've been told by the government. And you know what? None of them know either. <laughs> We're trying to find out the essence of our insanity. We don't go to the doctor who dwells within. No, we go to the patient on the next floor. <laughs> Why am I like this? Well, I'm the school counselor, and I'll tell you why you're like you are. And after he gets done telling you why you're like you are, he goes to his psychologist to find out why he's like he is. <laughs> huh? And the psychologist is in a therapy class. Because he has sexual problems. <laughs> One nut is telling the other nut what's wrong. But I have a degree that makes me a smart nut. <laughs> a nut by any other name is a nut. And we're all nuts, see? But we tell each other. We never go to the doctor. And the doctor dwells in the center of our pain. That's what you're told about here. So, so now here's the, here's the point here. Just so we're setting the story up because this gets really involved. Remember, we're talking about Exodus here. We're talking about the movement out of Egypt, across the Red Sea to the Promised Land. That has nothing to do with Egypt. Has nothing to do with the Red Sea. Has nothing to do with the Promised Land. It's talking about a movement out of the lunacy of your own mind across that which is the churning, raging emotions of your being to that which is the right hemisphere of the brain where you've never been. Where you've never been. So can I say something? Stand up, please. Um, you Turn were, I, I was going to let it go, but I, I couldn't. When you talk about going to the doctor, uh, when you do inner child work and you do writing with your less dominant hand and you access the right side of your brain, you're going to the doctor. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And don't forget... That in all of the, you remember, you know, if, for those of you who have listened to these other studies we've done in Genesis, you know that every child of promise, every child of promise is born of a woman who is barren or born out of the water. Every single one. And this child that she's talking about is inside of you. There is a child inside of you who has been ruined by your parents or has been ruined by your schools or has been ruined by the system that you live in and that child is hurt. That child is crippled. That child cannot function. And that's the only part of you that God wants, the wounded child within you. And we'll get to that when we get to the story of Joseph. Inside of yourself, you will take that child. And then that child will grow. You will take that child to Joseph. You will take that child to that which is the inner aspect of your mind. And that child will be nurtured at the right hemisphere and lifted up. And then the child will lead you. The government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and it is the wounded child within you who becomes the child of promise, who then takes over your life. And it's so personal. It is none of my business. It is none of anybody's business. It is none of your parents' business. It is none of your children's business. It is none of your relatives' business. It is none of the business of the government. It is none of the business of anybody. It is only yours. It is a private aspect that happens within you when you are willing to go to the backside of the desert, rise up to the mountain, and there touch on the mountain, that place of fire, and there you will be told, the name of God is I am, which means it is you, and you will be instructed on these things of the serpent and the fire and entering within yourself and reassured that you can take it back whenever you wish to. That authority that is yours, that ego, that authority, you can have it back whenever you want and whenever you say. But to realize also that those who surround you will be affected by you when you take that truth, which is the second stage, spill it on the dark dry aspect of the mind, it will turn into blood, which means it will turn into spirit and everything will be born out of that. Ah. But now, you look at me. Then maybe some of you just come and you look at me. Ah. And what does it say? Oh man, that sounds heavy. That sounds really heavy. What am I now? And look what it says in Exodus 4. In verse 10, what does Moses say? Hey, look, 
I'm not eloquent. I mean, I, I, I'm slow with speech. In other words, you know what you're saying? Yeah, maybe Bill can do that. Or maybe, you know, uh, Nostradamus. Uh, but I mean, I live in Fork and River, or I live in Weird Time. I mean, how am I going to do this? Who? I mean, I can't do this stuff. And the whole purpose of this encounter is to say, yes, you can. Because there is a part in you, which is another symbol, an electronic symbol, there is another part within you, and in mysticism, that part is known as Aaron, Moses' brother. And that brother of yours was is another aspect of the mind, simply saying, there is something inside of you, and I will give that word, I will give that understanding, and if you don't have the confidence in yourself because you've been so beaten down by the system, there is another part of you that I will give it to, and it will come, and it will speak within you, and it will save you, and it will take you to Pharaoh, it will take you to that ego of yourself, and one day as we move into the story, you'll suddenly see all of this come within you, where you confront the Pharaoh, you confront your own ego, and you say, let me go. I want out. I don't want this anymore. I don't like the way I'm living. I don't think this is the way life should be. I don't like it for my children. I don't like it for my family. I don't like it for the animals. I don't like it for nature. Let me go. And you'll see how hard it is to get freed from that. But one day, you will look at the point of your churning, raging emotions, and you will lift yourself up, and you will raise yourself up, and those emotions will split apart, and you will run across to the promised land all inside of you, and life will explode in light and enlightenment and understanding and peace. And so in the story part, it brings Aaron, because now the point is you're going to have to confront yourself. And some of you have been so beat up by the things you've experienced in this life and other lives that you don't have any confidence to do that. Some of you have been so filled with guilt by people who have had control of your lives in the past, that you have lost all of your confidence. And so it said here, okay, I understand that. All I'm asking you to do is come to the mountain. I'll send the words down. I'll send the energy down. I'll send that which is necessary down. But there is a part of you that has been untouched by those, and that part will confront your ego for you, and he will convince your ego to let you go. So they come down from the mountain, and it's time to confront the Pharaoh, and it's time to be set free. And it all has to do with you, your life, and your family. Thank you very much for sharing this time with us, and the, ver the bush and the serpent and the rod. Deep things, isn't there? So we've been allowed to understand some of these things that has been told to me, and I tell it to you. And if you think about it, and you know what? Those of you who are even in this room, just feel inside of yourself because what you've heard is stirring alive inside. You can feel inside of your own skin that which you've heard through your ears because something has come to life. Right this minute, you can feel it inside of yourself because something is stirring inside of you. This is the awesome truth, the universal truth, which has been hidden from all mankind. And she has stirred. And even in hearing this, you can feel it inside of your physical body. There's your first sense of proof. And the rest will also happen exactly the way it is told on Fire Mountain. <laughs>